For over 50 years, the British Touring Car Championship has been one of the world's most popular motorsport series. This is the story of the legendary drivers, the legendary cars, and the legendary moments that have made it such a success. The mind's an animal. This is Touring Car Legends. It's the early 80s and Ford has just launched the Sierra, a radical replacement for the iconic Cortina. Cruelly dubbed the Jelly Mould, its futuristic styling put off British salesmen from Burnley to Basingstoke. The new Ford Sierra. It's one of the most efficient, aerodynamic driver's cars ever made. Test drive the new Ford Sierra yourself. It's man and machine in perfect harmony. Sales were struggling. Ford needed a solution, so they turned to the British Touring Car Championship to give the Sierra an image boost. The cars were good, the, you know, the racing was good then, and of course, uh, television had started to take an interest in the championship at that stage too. But the Sierra was the jelly mold car. It followed the Cortina, and Ford was struggling to sell it, I think. And so, as soon as it came out, they, they gave us a program to develop it for racing in preparation for the Sierra Cosworth. The car we had was a Mercure, which had an American 2.3 litre iron block turbo engine. So it was our first turbo car, so it was quite a, a rapid learning curve for us, really, to go from a Rover V8 to a turbocharged Ford. But we got it to go very well and won the championship with it in 85. This is Brands Hatch. Not for the first time, a major manufacturer was racing on a Sunday to sell on a Monday. And this is the Ford Sierra a car that's never stopped improving. When I won the championship with the first Sierra, Ford produced a one-minute TV ad that was shown in, in the middle of the news at 10 for about six months. And so my name was mentioned and my face was in this advert, so people knew me. That made a massive difference to my, you know, with the way that I was recognised. During that period, we all became well-known. And, uh, you know, it was a really great time, it was. <laughs> It's a 90 horsepower, 1.8 family five-seater. And in 1985, it made Andy Rouse British saloon car champion. The Ford Sierra's time has come. Racing success transformed the Sierra's reputation. And in 1987, its legend was complete with the launch of the RS500. This was a homologation special built for racing. They were challenging cars to drive because they were 500 horsepower and the tyres weren't all that big. Although the Sierra was a good car overall, it, the handling wasn't that great really because you weren't allowed to lower the car as much as you'd like to. One of the things I remember about driving the Sierra was how hot it was inside because the turbocharger was just the other side of the bulkhead on the driver's side and the exhaust pipe was under the seat. So after, after like half an hour, it'd be so hot in there you, wouldn't be able, you couldn't touch the floor. Rouse never won the championship in an RS500, but did enjoy some titanic battles with the likes of Rob Gravitt and Steve Soper. It was just a great car. It just sort of stepped up. The whole car had been built around Let's Go Motor Racing, and Ford did a fantastic job at the time. It had sort of over 500 horsepower, and it did everything you wanted it to do. After a promising single-seater career was cut short by an accident, Tim Harvey switched to touring car racing and won three races in an RS500 in the late 80s. The Sierra was, was especially in its RS500 guys, really were the, uh, the masters. But they, they produced 560 horsepower, did 175 miles an hour, not on, on a long straight, on a normal circuit. So they were quite fantastic cars. This was a fun time to be a touring car driver. It was great times and uh, those cars really, I don't see the like of them ever coming back. We were still able to have a bit of fun in those days. In those days, all the drivers had their own motorhomes. We'd all corral up at the circuits and we'd have a lot of fun. It was a really good crack. We always used to hope we'd have a four or five o'clock race the next day so that we'd have got the alcohol out of our system by the time it came round. 
For many, the RS500 was the iconic touring car of the late 1980s, but it was not the only show in town. And that's Ian Forrest, almost lost the BMW. Godfrey Hall passing him in the black BMW. Frank Sintner passing him on the right, and they sandwich him. Bonk, bonk, on either side. A BMW sandwich, and away they go. BMW entered the BTCC in the early 80s and won its maiden title in 1988 in the hands of Frank Sittner and the ProDrive team run by David Richards. Frank Sittner turned up at the offices here in Banbury and said, um, would you build me an M3 to do the British Touring Car Championship in? We sort of mulled over it for a few days and looked around and thought, well, we've got all the bits to do this and we're building the rally cars anyway, so... Let's do it. And off we went with Frank, and that was our first foray into touring car racing. Sittner would be joined in a BMW by Steve Soper, who would swap his RS500 for an M3. ProDrive BMW was great fun because you could actually give it everything. And it was a lovely light car, very agile, handled absolutely what you would imagine a saloon car should handle like. Um, it was a great great car. I still got very fond memories of those cars. They were fantastic, fantastic to race. ProDrive's arrival coincided with full-time coverage on BBC Grandstand. The cars and drivers were about to become household names as race highlights were broadcast weekly with commentary from Murray Walker. Rabbit is going through. Rabbit is taking the lead. He has taken the lead and there's contact. And off goes Gravit, not quite off. Andy Rouse keeps on his way. There's going to be a big argument about that too, I am sure. And Andy Rouse, the leader, has got away. When you're commentating, you haven't got the luxury of looking at the picture and thinking, shall I say it this way, or shall I say it that way, or shall I say it this way? You say what comes into your head to describe the picture that you are seeing and the emotions that you are feeling. I always regarded my job as a commentator was not just to inform. Anybody can talk about who's leading and who's in third place. I was always conscious of the fact that we were in show business and it was my job not only to inform but hopefully to entertain as well. Right up alongside him into the racing line and there's contact and he's lost it. Jerry Mann has lost it, looks over his shoulder straight onto the gravel trap. And that is it. Wally! I don't think Jerry is at all happy. And I suppose you can hardly blame him. I have a massive like for uh, Murray. He's just a lovely, lovely man. And uh, it, he was great to have involved in the championship. And I think it was his dulcet tones and some clever cut and shut of some of the video coverage that weren't live races in those days that made some of the races so exciting. But Murray, with his classic one-liners, and, and he would trip himself up deliberately just to make himself look a little foolish, which is just fabulous. You can't underestimate the, the value that Murray brought into the championship. I was paying a bill for, for, for Murray to be there for two days in the studio at BHP in London doing the voiceover. And I thought, this is nuts. Two, why am I paying someone two days to do a half-hour voiceover um, full of mistakes? Um, and it's only when I sat, went in there one day and I sat down there for two days and I saw Murray doing it, you think, this guy's a pro. The mistakes weren't always mistakes. They were there um, uh, uh, on purpose a lot of the times. But he would sit there for a whole day just going through every, every minute of the, of the action, writing everything down. And so you saw that for two days, yeah, he put his heart and soul into it. And I didn't mind paying his bill then. Everyone loved Murray Walker, and, and he had a genuine enthusiasm for the races. He would come to the races without having any work to do, but he would just come to the races just to be there. So he was a genuine enthusiast for it. BBC Grandstand began showing BTCC highlights in the late 80s, and one of the most memorable races was from the 1989 Championship Decider. Vauxhall's John Clennon had been battling BMW's James Weaver and arrived at the final round with a dose of paranoia. I had heard all sorts of rumours that a BMW on the grid was uh, being asked to wipe me out. Now, whether that's true, whether it was paranoia, I'm really not sure, but I wasn't prepared to take the chance. All I had to do was win the class and try and get fastest lap, and the championship was mine. 
but in wet conditions, Cleland qualified among the BMWs, calling for some drastic action. That's Cleland at the back of the grid and everybody's surging past him and he seems to be having some sort of a gear selection problem. I said to my wife the night before, I think the safest way to do this is for me to stall on the grid and start at the back. And there was nothing in the rules that said I couldn't do that. And I then proceeded to sort of pick my way through the class. I knew I could do it because the car was very capable of doing it. Championship leader John Cleland is up to 23rd out of 35. And he's leading his class. He's broken the lap record and that will do nicely, John. Got the fastest lap, got the class win and got the championship. It was great relief because the, the, nobody in the team knew what I was up to. Only my wife. <laughs> Almost home to win the British Touring Car Championship of 1989, John Cleland in his Vauxhall Astra 16 valve. I spent all year staying out of the way of BMWs and I figured that I was in the pack and it was maybe better to sort of steer clear of the trouble. There was no element of a predetermined plan. Oh, not at all. Not BMW. at all. <laughs> you were a little bit worried about that before. Yes, well, James Weaver's mechanics tried to lock me in the, in the truck before the race, so I knew there was a, a plan afoot somewhere. I think there was a bit of suspicion afterwards, but there was so much riding in that because it was Vauxhall's first foray into the British Touring Car Championship, which they stayed in for a further 20 years. In those days, you, you win races on the Sunday and you sell cars on the Monday. And that was really what this whole thing was about. We had to win this championship. And to beat the mighty BMW, it was really important. A new era of BTCC was dawning, but the arrival of mainstream television put pressure on touring cars' age-old class system. Casual viewers struggled to understand why the fastest cars weren't winning the championship. That era was rather difficult because you had the three, four classes and you'd have the Sierra Cosworths, the flames out the side of them, rushing around at the front of the field, lapping everybody. You'd have us with the M3s and then you'd have John Cleland driving in a, in a Vauxhall at the back and winning the championship. So nobody really knew what was going on. It wasn't a, an ideal environment for, for manufacturers or for sponsors for that matter. It never felt to me like I really deserved to win the British Stone Car Championship, having won it from the lower classes, but up until that point, it had always been won from the lower classes. 12th in a race was the highest I ever finished. How can I win the most prestigious championship in the UK and not win a race? So that didn't really mean that much to me. It was many years later that it started to sink in. Something had to be done. A group of us got together at that time and uh, sat down to think about the future of the championship. If I remember, it was Andy Rouse, there was Dave Cook from Vauxhall, um, there was myself, David Lapworth on our technical side. And we, we sat down, we analysed what we needed to do to sort of make a championship that worked for everybody for the long term. Most of the manufacturers were, their mainstream products were front wheel drive. and. Um, but nobody raced front wheel drive, so particularly competitively at that time. So it was quite radical thinking and the idea to get a balance of performance between front wheel drive and rear wheel drive was also fairly novel at the time. The two litre formula was instigated for all the good reasons. That, that, that's what was needed. That's what the marketplace wanted at the time. You know, the manufacturers wanted to publicise their mid-range cars and their mass produced cars rather than the home legation specials. I think that's why it became so popular, because people that came to the racetrack and watched the racing or watched it on TV could obviously relate to the car that they had in the garage or drove to work every day. For 1991, there will be a single class of two-litre cars. BMW, Vauxhall, Toyota, Nissan and Ford all signed up for the launch of what would soon become known as the Super Touring Era. And 1991 is go! And it's a searing start from Will Hoy on the left. Now we're with Steve Soper. Up to Cops, he's in second place. Hoy on the left, into Cops corner. Three abreast. It's Will Hoy, BMW, Cleland, Soper, Palmer in his BMW. And there's Palmer on the left, he's turning in. Bump! He's hit Andy Rouse, off! Off goes the Toyota. What a start for his first Toyota race. Now we're looking back from Steve Soper's car at Andy Rouse in the Carina. And he's going for third. From the first race, the action was frenetic. In that first year, four drivers each won three races for three different manufacturers. One of those was John Cleland, whose partnership with Vauxhall would be a highlight of Super Touring. John Cleland goes ahead of Will Hoy into second place at Stoke Corner. 
from getting into the Cavalier, I knew that we were going somewhere because, you know, from the very first race, really, we were competitive with them. It was the fleet car turned good, you know, it was just the reps car through the week, but it won races at weekends. Mostly it was about John Cleland in a Cavalier against the mighty BMW with German drivers, British drivers and all in sundry. So it was real sleeves up, get on with it and get your elbows out. It made me a bit of a hero back at the at the plant at Luton where they make these cars, but I mean, effectively we didn't have a race car like BMW and made a road car out of it. We had a road car that thousands and thousands of reps up and down the country drove, and I was racing it at weekends and winning races as well. He's a sort of Scottish, Scottish co Cockney Sparrow to me. He's not a Cockney, of course, he's very, very Scottish, but he's got that almost bird-like brightness uh, tremendously quick-witted, great fun, very sharp sense of humour, uh, cracking driver, uh, and he was driving for Vauxhall, and Vauxhall was not a car that you expected to be winning races in a British Touring Car Championship against all the other works cars. But the publicity they got from it was absolutely fantastic. And John Cleland and the Cavalier contributed massively to the enormously improved image that they got. 1991 was famous for some classic battles. Cleland went head-to-head -head with the late Will Hoy in his BMW M3. And it's a sensational start by Will Hoy from row two. Out of the old hairpin, up Starkey's, into McLean's, and Will Hoy is going through. Hoy goes through into the lead. Steve Soper is following him. He's going through into second position. Soper goes through into second. Cleland goes down to third position. And when he wasn't fighting Cleland, Hoy battled with Steve Soper in another BMW. And Hoy leads. Soper second. Into Priory. This is it. Then from Priory. And Soper goes through. Steve Soper goes through and into the lead. Will Hoy drops back as they go round Brooklyn to the left hander. Steve Soper BMW leads. Will Hoy BMW. The championship came down to the season finale. It was the M3's final race and it would go out in style. Okay. All right. I'll be watching for you in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> They're off and Andy Rouse leads. Hoy has gone up alongside Cleland into Cops, the first right-hander. Here they are, Rouse leading. Hoy in second place, John Cleland third. And Andy Middlehurst, Ford Sierra, is up into fourth position. We're in car with Hoy and he's passing Cleland. In fact, he's passed Cleland and he is up into sixth position with Jonathan Palmer ahead of him and almost hitting him. Jonathan Palmer faltering, so Will Hoy goes up into fifth position and Hoy finishes fifth to become 1991's British Touring Car Champion for himself, for BMW, for his team and his sponsors and very well deserved it is too. It's all been about keeping scoring points. If you couldn't win, You've had to score points to keep the momentum going. And I think that's why we've won the championship. We've, we've always been up there. Will Hoy, fabulous guy. He was a really close mate. I would race side by side with Will. I could do a lap of Thruxton, Donington or anywhere side by side with Will Hoy and trust him every inch of the way. Very sad loss to motorsport. He was a great buddy. The 1992 championship would trump that of 91 and go down as one of the most exciting and controversial in British touring car history. Newly crowned champion Hoy moved to Toyota to partner four-time champion Andy Rouse. Round all four absolutely together. This is magnificent. But the dream team became a nightmare. Well, it leads then. The two Toyotas together, round Westfield. Big shunt, Brands Hatch. That did a series of amount of damage to those two cars, and it also wrecked our championship chances. If we hadn't had that accident, Will Hoy could have won the championship for the second time in a row. Oh dear, these two are teammates, Will Hoy and Andy Rouse. And Andy Rouse's body language says rage and fury. It was a pretty big issue, really, but it was unnecessary. That was that was the point. He pushed up the inside at Hawthorne's out the back of the circuit and he bounced off the inside curb and, and sort of collected me as he came through the corner. So I was on the outside. So we ended up hitting the barrier, the pair of us, really hard. And we beat each other and all we had to do was beat John Clennand. I nearly fell off the track laughing. Watching these two ricocheting off the barriers and I, 
I had to stop myself from crying with laughter, and I think, <laughs> how good is that? That was easy. The Foxhalls win. Ellen first, Ellen second, and one tenth of a second between them. Despite the brand's debacle, Hoy would still go into the final round at Silverstone as one of three drivers capable of winning the championship. John Clennon had dominated the start of the year, only for Tim Harvey to fight back in the new BMW 318 IS. This is going to be Tim Harvey's third win of the season. Thank you again, says Tim Harvey. Harvey and teammate Soper were thrown a curveball when team manager Vic Lee was sentenced to 12 years in jail for smuggling cocaine in a team transporter. The police had wondered why the team were testing so frequently at the Zandvoort circuit in Holland. We had a very difficult year that year. We were uncompetitive at the beginning of the year and then suddenly we found the sweet spot and suddenly Tim got on a roll. Losing the team owner halfway through the season was hard. Everything had been blown up in the press. Getting BMW to agree to let us carry on was a huge effort. Um, they, they didn't want to see those cars. We pleaded with them to let us carry on with the championship. We turned up at Donington and the, the truck was there and all the team members were there. We were waiting for a phone call to say, no, you're not, you're not allowed to race or yes, carry on. And we got the yes. For all his faults, he still ran the best motor racing team that I ever drove for. Nobody worked harder at the attention to detail and was more enthusiastic about the effort that they put in and the end result than Vic. Going into the final race of the season, Harvey, Cleland and Hoy would go head to head in a title decider. It would become an infamous day in BTCC history. No question, he took me out. There was only one benefactor that day and it wasn't Steve and it wasn't me. It's the final round of the 1992 BTCC Championship at Silverstone, and the top three drivers are separated by just a handful of points. What happens next is part of touring car folklore. The stakes are massive, and it's go for 15 laps. In car with Tim Harvey, 12th on the grid, past James Kay, and that's O'Dor, Keith O'Dor on the Nissan, he's gone ahead. Into Cops Corner, Roush leads, Alan second. David Leslie's up into third place. In car with Sofa, he started fourth, he's still fourth. I was there to help Tim Harvey win the championship, but not at all costs. And he's catching Leslie, Club Corner, Sofa goes for third. He's right up alongside the box, all he's passed it. He's spinning, he's lost it. I lent on David on the first lap. He was having none of it, and David took no prisoners. He got taken out. I'm not sure he was taken out, but he did have an incident with David Leslie. And he thought, many years later, when Steve and I have talked about this, he thought David Leslie was part of our master plan to deliberately take him out. He's been hit. Somebody's hit him. It's Rob Gravitz Peugeot has hit Steve Soper, and he's down to last again. And look at the bodywork. So I then get going again, and obviously the adrenaline's pumping, and I'm now irritated and annoyed that the master plan has gone wrong. And I actually went from the back of the grid to where I caught Tib and John without touching one car. So I didn't muscle my way from the back back to the front by pushing and shoving and leaning on people. I didn't touch a single car until I came across John. Meanwhile, Harvey muscled his way past Hoy, sending the Toyota tumbling down the order. And Harvey's attacking Hoy, he's on the inside of Cops. Hoy is drifting wide, he's on the curb, he's off, he's off. Harvey's lost momentum, there's Cleland going past him, Sofa going past him. Now Tim Harvey is down to sixth position. The gloves are off at Beckett's. The amazing Steve Sofa is in fifth position from 21st after his recovery. I only had to follow Will Hoy, Tim Harvey, and then me, in any position. It didn't matter if we were first, second, third, eight, nine, ten. If it was Will, Tim, and me, the championship was mine. But what I hadn't banked on was the Exocet missile Soper arriving on the scene. Tim was behind John, and I had to sort of get Tim in front of John. Up to club corner. Soper goes through to fourth position inside the box hole. And Harvey's right behind, Harvey's attacking Cleland, there's Harvey, there's Cleland. So Cleland 
Callender stayed ahead, but Sofa is ahead of the Vauxhall. So John Clelland is sandwiched between the two BMWs. I'm going for first, says John Clelland. I thought I carried a lovely manoeuvre where I sort of passed Tim and John and then blocked John and got Tim in front of both of us. So all of that worked. Tim Harvey in the second BMW is inside Clelland at Bridge. He's gone through. He's up to fifth position. He's up to fourth position because Steve Sober's led him through. Tim Harvey is leading the championship again. Unfortunately, I think John then thought, hey oh, my championship's going out of the window. He pulled an absolute masterstroke coming under bridge and allowed Harvey to get in. I went real wide, a real fast run through the next two corners, and then it all got messy. John Clelland is attacking Sober. He's up on two wheels. Sober holds his line. He's pushed right out to the right. He attacks again as they go to the right end and love you. And they both spin. They're both out. Sober and Clelland both out of the race. Obviously, he'll tell a different story, but my story is he got a bit desperate at McLean's um, and seriously lent on me. I do think if my car wasn't there, he probably would have fallen over. He will say if your car wasn't there, I wouldn't have taken that line, which I respect. I dived down the inside of Steve, but I didn't actually lean on him at that point, but he kept coming over looking for an apex. So I pulled to the left slightly, got the curb on the inside, which popped the thing up onto two wheels, which made it look even more dramatic than it was. But it was up till that point, I hadn't touched him. There was no paint had changed hands. And then I did a non-compromised move at the next corner. And that was my error. That move at the next corner wasn't, right, I'm going to take you off. I thought he would have seen me coming. He sort of turned in and I was already there. No question, he took me out and that's, still to this day is what I think happened. Steve was more than capable of going round that next corner without taking me off. There was no argument. There was only one benefactor that day and it wasn't Steve and it wasn't me. Six victories for Tim Harvey this year and now beating both Cleland and Hoy, Andy Rouse wins for the 60th time in his career and Tim Harvey wins the Drivers' Championship for BMW. A superb drive by Tim Harvey. Joy for the team. There's Tim, and it is for John Cleland, utter dejection. There were mistakes on both drivers' part, let me put it that way, but we were driving, obviously, to win the championship. Um, I'd overtaken Steve and John to be in front of them when the incident took place, and crucially, by being in front, I was going to win the championship anyway. So it wasn't as though I drove through the accident to win. I mean, it did happen behind me. Uh, John initiated the, the aggression, and Steve finished it off. That's probably about the best way of summing it up. If I was there to take him out, I could have done it very easy, made it look like an accident, and still finish the race maybe on the podium. So to take him out and myself out was not the plan. If I wanted to put him off, I'd just have pushed him and pushed him and pushed him to the right hand side, got him on the grass, and that would have been the end of it, or got him on the loose marbles. But I gave him enough room then, foolishly, turned into the next corner and all I could hear was this BMW doing 45,000 revs coming at me at the speed of sound. And that was, the, that was it, end of story. Cleland's reaction on getting out of his car is almost as famous as the accident itself. It looked worse than it was. What actually had happened, because bear in mind, I'd broken my sternum and my lower back in an incident a fortnight or three weeks beforehand. I actually had padding in my shoulders of my, my overalls to stop the seat belts opening up my chest. So when I got out, I looked a little bit like an American football player. I didn't know where he was at that point because from where I'd got out of the car, I couldn't see him. I didn't realise that he'd also gone off. At that stage, I, I was standing sort of thinking, well, that was a bit rough. Where did he go? Then I realised that he was in the gravel. So I naturally went across to try and have a chat with him. What I didn't know was he had a load of broken ribs at the time. So I, I could have been a bit braver and got out of the car and confronted him, but I couldn't actually open the door. So I was trying to get out and, and uh, he was banging on the window calling me all sorts of names. And I mean, I was still fed up with him at the time, so it's probably just as well I didn't get out. So I tried to yank the door open, but he was inside holding onto the door to make sure it didn't open, which was maybe fortunate for all of us because I was gonna have a serious discussion with him. And we then got separated by the marshals who didn't think this was a good idea. 
The man chopped me a couple of times, then he runs into me. It takes me straight into barriers. I mean, what are we doing here? Is this stock car racing or is this motorsport? He might get away with that in Germany where he might be Mr. Superstar. But this is clean. The man's an animal. Of course, it made it an iconic race. It's one we still talk about. Um, it both defined my championship in terms of it, the year I won was that year, the accident, but it also tarnished it a little bit because it happened in that same period. But I'd rather people were still talking about it than not at all. So I guess it's a case of any publicity is good publicity. It made the front pages of everything and it just got coverage like you wouldn't believe. And I think that was the real moment that touring cars became a real spectator sport, a real following. That's what made touring cars so special and so popular with the, with the viewers. It was just that one event. Australian Alan Gow, the man in charge of the championship, admits the publicity was a welcome boost. It was great. The shame was it was the last event of the year because, because if you had that sort of publicity um, during the course of the year, the crowds would have swelled for, for the last bit of the year, but you sort of couldn't take advantage of it because it was another six months before we started racing again. While Gao enjoyed the attention, Clennon and Soper faced an inquest that would go on for several months. It looked all intents and purposes, Steve had deliberately taken me off. The RAC wanted something done about it, so they called the tribunal and they were going to take someone apart. The night before the tribunal, John rang me and he had a solicitor and I had a solicitor and it was going to be, you know, one of us was obviously going to end up taking the, the rat. I said, Steve, this is silly. What we need to do here is go in joined up. Let me tell you what I think we should do. I don't want you to lose your license. It doesn't get me back my championship. Harvey will not suffer for this. Let's work with a plan. It was a racing incident. You didn't take me out and we'll go with that. I said, well, you, you stick your hand up first and say, you don't have a problem, and then I'll follow. I said, I'm not trusting <laughs> I'm not trusting you for me to say it was a racing accident. No, I mean, you know. But that, that's basically what we did, and I think, unfortunately, the RSC got very upset that they couldn't get one of us and hang us up. Former champion Wynne Percy was one of the RSC committee members charged with apportioning blame. They came in like two little schoolboys, you know, with their tails between their legs, um, looking very innocent and, you know, as you'd expect them to. I'd made my point that you know, best, it's best one of those things forgotten. But by all means, give them a right rollicking. Percy is one of motorsport's purists, but even he admits the fans like a good scrap. Hell hath no fury like a woman ram. But the crowd loved it. When you speak to the public that watch motor racing, if you analyse why people go racing, the sad truth is, a lot of people go to watch accidents and incidents. It's terrible, but it's true. To a lot of people, if it's a boring race because someone's driven very, very well, but there's been no incidents, they don't enjoy it the same as if there's a crash. Crashing was something that 1993 would also be best remembered for, thanks in part to the exploits of two former Grand Prix drivers. And now your mouthful thunders into the barrier. It's the 1993 Silverstone Grand Prix support race and former Tyrrell and Lotus Formula One driver Julian Bailey is lying second to teammate Will Hoy's Toyota Carina. Julian Bailey and Will Hoy the Toyota's the biggest event of the year, which is a Grand Prix meeting. They were heading for their first ever win. Toyota had never won in that, in that car. And so they're heading for a one, two. It was fantastic. It was a dream, dream uh, victory in front of a, a Grand Prix crowd. It had everything. And then, Unfortunately, Julian, I think, made a bit of a clunky move on Will. Julian Bailey is flying. He's attacking his teammate, Will Hoy. In fact, he's really attacked him. That's it. Off goes Will Hoy, skating to a standstill on his roof. Will went onto his roof. Nissan came through and won the race. They probably received more publicity out of that incident than if they won. At the end of the day, Toyota did very well out of it as well. The incident also prompted one of the greatest Murrayisms of all time. The car upside down is a Toyota, with Will Hoy crawling out of it. When I came out with the line, the car on its roof is a Toyota, it was a play on the fact that the Toyota advertising slogan at that time was, the car in front is a Toyota. But I, d I hadn't thought of it before. I didn't know it was going to happen, obviously. I hadn't thought of it beforehand. I thought that would be a good thing to say sometime. It just came out. 
you're very competitive with your own teammate. He is the first guy you've got to beat. But what you don't do is take him out. And you certainly don't throw him on his roof at the Grand Prix support round at Silverstone in front of the pits. That's a no-no. But the impact of Bailey's spill will be nothing compared with the appearance of one Nigel Mansell at Donington Park. The 92 F1 World Champion had just won the 93 Champ Car Championship in America, and this was his homecoming. Donington and ourselves got together and put Nigel Mansell in a car at the Donington Toka event, which wasn't a championship event. Of course, Nigel hadn't raced in this country since he won the World Championship because he went straight over to America. And, and this was the first opportunity for Nigel to, to, to see his fans, if you like, after winning uh, the Formula One World Championship. Mansell will be driving Andy Rouse's Ford Mondeo. I don't think he realised what he was letting himself in for. He thought it was more like a, a celebrity race, when in actual fact it was a serious motor race. <laughs> And when we first sent him out for, during the test day, he couldn't go slow enough. He, he couldn't brake early enough. And so he, he went off the road and wrecked the, the car a few times. So we fixed it a couple of times and then he damaged it so badly. We had to give him Paul Radisic's car to practice in because he still hadn't got the hang of it. Come race day, our Nige had no trouble drawing a crowd. He was a great big star at the time, wasn't he? Because he was IndyCar champion and Formula One champion at the same time. And here he was coming to Donington to drive a touring car. That was just an immense um, uh, event. We, there was something like 68,000 people uh, crammed the gates uh, to, to get in. Another ex-Formula One driver was having a rare touring car outing as yours truly was called up to drive a Vauxhall Cavalier. Now third and fourth. Nigel Mansell looking for a way past Nidell. He's got the inside line at Redgate, but they make contact. Nidell bumps the front of Nigel Mansell, who muscles his way through, and Mansell's up into third place. Another big cheer from the partisan crowd. Mansell had barged past me into third, but soon found out just how tough touring car racing can be. And now Sofa's up into fourth place. Nidell's down to fifth as they come through the El Hairpin. And Mansell sideways, the Mondeo fish tailing. He's off again, Nidell takes him, and Nigel Mansell thunders into the barrier. A very big accident indeed. The Ford Mondeo lies absolutely shattered by the side of the road. With Mansell struggling to regain control, I went for where there had been a gap. Chief Nidell has nowhere to go. He hits Mansell, who slides across the grass into the barrier just in front of the bridge parapet down at Starkey's Bridge. Mansell went off to hospital and Ford were left with a hefty repair bill. But for the BTCC, Mansell mania was a triumph. It was such a big deal. That race was in the media from the Thursday before until the Wednesday afterwards because Nigel crashed, of course. It was front page news across the world. And it, it, it was really amazing to, uh, you know, to be involved in that. And, and the fact that Nigel drove my car and crashed my car and wrote it off. <laughs> you had a high profile TV presenter involved in the incident and people and those two slagging each other. It just had everything. And so it was on the front page of pretty much every daily newspaper the next day. That one event probably did more for the BTCC um, than any other event in the first 10 years. As they come up to McLean's now, this group battling for second, third and fourth, and Mansell again trying the wide line, looking for grip. He's found grip. Mansell had unfinished business with touring cars, and in 1998, he returned in spectacular style at Donington Park. And Mansell says, thank you, I'm through on the inside. Oh, a little touch there with Glellan. And Mansell, who would believe this man hasn't been racing touring cars for years? This is real touring car racing, and Mansell's right in the thick of it. He just drove the car as he drove it and, and forgot about it as a touring car. And so he's doing things with that car that other drivers would never have done. And the way he manhandled that around was, was, was totally at odds with how you'd normally treat a touring car, but he didn't know what to do, if you like. So he just used his raw speed, and that's what got him there. And Mansell again is going to try something here. Sure. Oh, Reed's lost it! Reed's lost it! Was there contact? I don't know. But Reed's off! Bang! Into the barrier on the outside. Mansell now in control. And the Ford guys can barely believe their eyes. Mansell leads the race. Now the battle is on for second place behind him. Mansell would finish the race just off the podium, but his appearance went down well with the other drivers. There was a fair bit of doubt, a fair bit of pessimism down the pit lane over the past week about actually what Nigel would achieve, but he's, uh, he's put all that right. Oh, I mean, I, when I saw the, the restart, and he was in the gaggle, and he was in the gaggle, I don't believe this. How can one man be so lucky? <laughs> and then all of a sudden he leaves a blinking race. I'm like, what is going on here? 
Nigel never actually won a race, but his exploits certainly made him a touring car legend. Great job, mate. Well done. While Bailey and Mansell were still getting to grips with touring car racing, yet another F1 refugee, Joe Winklehock, was taking the 1993 championship for the Works Schnitzer BMW team. His teammate Steve Soper had been the early favourite. From BMW Germany's point of view and my boss at the time, that was my championship. And I should have won it. You know, I'm English, I know the circuits like the back of my hand. Joe was coming over, a lot of the circuits he had to learn, he hadn't been there before. And that's why, although it hurts, it, he beat me fair and square. But at the time, uh, I did think it was mine. I think the team thought it was mine, but he got a run on me. I finished second, quite close. I think I had two mechanical failures and a, a shunt. He beat me, you know, life goes on. Another one got away, if you like. Wigglehock was the first Grand Prix driver to win the championship since Jim Clark in 1964, and his arrival signalled the start of a new era for the BTCC. The gentlemen racers of yesteryear were being replaced with highly paid international superstars as car manufacturers went all out for victory. There was a period through the mid-90s where, you know, there were more paid touring car drivers in the British Championship than people paid to drive Formula One cars. It was fabulous. Everywhere I went in the world to race cars, Australia, South Africa, it didn't matter where it was, they knew about the British Touring Car Championship. We had 10, 11, 12 manufacturers at some points come into the, ch the championship with two car teams. You don't come in with a turkey, you come in with two professional drivers, highly paid guys that are capable of bringing a car home and a good result. So yeah, that was a tipping point. Everybody wanted to be in our championship. That's the way it was. As if to prove the point, Gabriele Tarquini and Alfa Romeo arrived in 1994 and won the championship at their first attempt. We're with Tarquini, he can almost see the chicken flag. And that is it, win number four. Tarquini wins. It was amazing, especially because I came with an Italian team, Italian driver. We was under pressure, especially because our car was very strong from the beginning. And... Uh, to, to win the season in the PTCC at this time, it was not so easy for an Italian driver. Don't know the, the race, don't know the atmosphere, don't know the track, because I must learn the tracks the, and also the, the, the opponent, because at this time the, the, the competitor was very high level. My car, the Alfa Romeo 155, was very, very fast. I had a very professional team, a lot of money and uh, everything uh, well done to win. And we won the first season. So. It was uh, an amazing uh, memories for me. But the 155 success was controversial. Anxious to improve the car's aerodynamics, Alfa came up with a novel solution. They came in with Alfa Romeo with a plastic bit on the front and a funny wing on the back that if you bought one down the street in your local Alfa Romeo dealer, all these bits would be in the boot. You had to bolt them on yourself. So there was a lot of discussion about whether it was legal or whether it wasn't. Yeah, it was a special homologation. I mean, um, uh, Alfa at this time was coming from uh, Fiat, Lancia, and uh, the top engineer comes from Rally, and they used this grey area to homologate the car, ensure that we use uh, all effort to, to, to make a very strong and fast car, in the end, uh, somebody in England doesn't, doesn't like these kind of things, and we had also a big fight with the rules and with the other team, but in the end everything was good, and I can continue the season. Probably every car on the grid had a less obvious quirk to them. The Alfa Romeo, at least it was an obvious one, because you could see what they were doing, but go into an Alfa dealer and find your front spoiler on, in the boot and everything else. There are a lot of cars out there that you learn later on that weren't quite what they should have been. And these were companies that were spending tens of millions of dollars or pounds on developing these cars, and we were never going to find everything they had. The stakes were getting ever higher, and the drivers were feeling the pressure. It was a time when you had to take it seriously. I mean, the, the amount of pressure and money was indescribable. The sort of late 80s drinking in motorhomes was all out the window. It was very serious. And, and that went right down to the driving on the track. Because if you were driving a Volvo and there was a Renault trying to get past, you were better off hitting that car and defending your line than letting him pass. Because you were letting another manufacturer overtake your car. And that's when the driving standards changed so massively because the element of defensive driving, even with contact, was introduced to stop other cars overtaking you. 
by 1995, the BTCC had hit the big time. Next time on Touring Car Legends, budgets go crazy as Formula One takes on the BTCC. Renault went to Williams Formula One racing and said, make us a Laguna. Jason Plato fights Matt Neal on and off the track. Be careful, Jason, be careful. And the next generation takes shape. For me, it was always about touring cars. It was never about Formula One or anything like that.